Thank you, Carl, for that very generous uh, introduction. Um, thanks to um, my old friend, Colonel Matt Dawson and AHEC uh, for, um, for having me here tonight. And thanks to all of you for showing up um, here tonight. It's also um, nice to be around a lot of old friends. A number of them I had dinner with, Matt Morton, Rob Satino, Mike uh, Nyberg, Tony Echevera. And my old, I just saw him right before the lecture started, uh, Colonel Jamie Royce, uh, we were planners together. Um, back at old 4th ID uh, Fort Hood days. Um, so again, I, I appreciate people coming here tonight. And again, Matt, thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, I was, um, I was, when I was driving into post, uh, I arrived about 3.30 and I went through the main gate and there's the, um, the sign up there, the digital sign. And right as I went past, I saw um, the title of my talk. But I didn't really put two and two together. And so the first couple of words I saw was a requiem. And I'm like, who the hell died? Jeez Louise. There's Josh Bradley sitting right back there, another old friend. Um, um, it's, you know, so, um, right, so I, I thought to myself, who, I said, oh, no, that's the title of my talk, a requiem for uh, counterinsurgency. So let me start off with a, um, uh, a simple unvarnished statement. Counterinsurgency is finished. It's dead. It's over. Now, when I say counterinsurgency is dead, it is finished, it is over, I'm not saying that the United States Army or the United States military will never do counterinsurgency again. It might, although it's hard to imagine in the current political international context uh, when it would in the near future. Um, but I'm not saying, when I say counterinsurgency is dead, I'm not saying that the United States will never do counterinsurgency again. When I say counterinsurgency is dead, what I'm saying is that the idea that counter, American counterinsurgency, and I'm gonna define what I mean by American counterinsurgency in a minute. Uh, th what is dead is the idea that American counterinsurgency as an operational framework to achieve uh, policy ends in Iraq and Afghanistan, the idea that counterinsurgency as an operational framework has worked to achieve policy ends at a reasonable cost in blood and treasure, that idea is dead and should be buried in the dustbin of history's really bad ideas. But before I can get on with this requiem of American counterinsurgency, for, let, me, let me first define, I mean, I think probably most folks in the audience here at the, at the Army War College in Carlisle Barracks um, and at AHAC have an understanding of what American counterinsurgency is, but let me just go over it again really quickly. Because there's a lot of ways for a military force to counter an insurgency. And American counterinsurgency represents a very, a, a, a very distinct kind of countering an insurgency. And it goes something like this. Um, a, a, in an American counterinsurgency, again, as codified, written down um, in Field Manual 3-24, in American counterinsurgency, a military force can put itself down on the ground in a foreign land where an insurgency is occurring. And according to this kind of counterinsurgency, that counterinsurgent force does a number of things when it puts itself down on the ground in a foreign land where an insurgency is occurring. Uh, and the things that this counterinsurgent force does, according to American counterinsurgency, is to provide the local population with a number of things. And let me go through those. Um, one thing that it does is it provides the local population with governance, both local and national. It helps to build local and national governing structures. The other thing that this counterinsurgent force uh, does is it builds infrastructure, roads, bridges, schools for girls. It helps to improve the economy. The other thing that this counterinsurgent force does in American counterinsurgency is it helps to build up local and national security forces. In American counterinsurgency doctrine, these things are called lines of effort. And then the other thing that the counterinsurgent force does when it places itself on the ground in a, in a foreign land um, is it does these things um, along with fighting the insurgency and providing ins uh, security, when it does these things according to American counterinsurgency almost simultaneously, and the priorities, priorities will shift um, within these lines of effort, the idea is that when the counterinsurgent force provides these things to the local population, it will win them over to its side, 
and the side of the government that this counterinsurgent force is supporting, and in winning the population over to the counterinsurgent side, it will separate them from the insurgents, and then the insurgents can be hunted down easily and either captured or killed. This is American counterinsurgency. This is Field Manual 3-24. And if you haven't already figured it out, it is the same thing as armed nation building. Because the way American counterinsurgency works is the way you defeat an insurgency is by building the, ins the, the basic institutions of a modern functioning state. Security, governance, infrastructure, those kinds of things. So when I say Amer the idea that American counterinsurgency as an operational method has worked, and that idea is dead, that's the kind of counterinsurgency that I'm talking about, okay? Um, so let me develop this argument a little bit. Counterinsurgency has not worked uh, as an operational method to achieve American policy aims in Iraq and Afghanistan. Let's go through some of the, the numbers and the data for Iraq and Afghanistan, starting with Iraq first. Um, recent reports show that close to 500,000 um, Iraqis uh, have been killed, either directly or indirectly, as a result of 8.8 .8 years of American occupation. Close to one million Iraqis were displaced, uh, displaced from their original homes. Very few of them have returned. Uh, the last time I checked on iCasualties.org, 4,883 Americans killed in action. Um, thousands and thousands more with life-changing wounds close to three trillion American dollars spent. Iraq is still mired in, I mean, just last year, I would have said it was mired in low-grade civil war. Now it is back to full-blown uh, civil war. Uh, the removal of the regime and, the, res and the, the subsequent occupation, we replaced one dictator with another strong-armed leader, and this one is allied with America's uh, regional adversary, Iran. I often think sometimes as a counterfactual, as a historical hypothetical, that if the United States had gone in once the order was given the United States military to remove the regime and it had left very quickly afterwards, would the levels of death and destruction have been any worse or any higher than during what actually happened during the 8.8 .8 years of American uh, occupation? Then let's look at Afghanistan. Uh, over 2,000 uh, Americans killed, thousands of Afghans killed, close to $1 trillion spent, and for, and it's still going, uh, it's still going on for the United States, and for a political objective, an actual very limited pol uh, political objective that I'm going to make a, uh, this argument later on in my talk that was achieved by the United States very early on in the war. So those are, that's, that's the data of Iraq and Afghanistan, the costs. Um, that's why I say American counterinsurgency as an operational method has not worked. But somehow, when staring at all of this evidence and all of this data, somehow the idea that American counterinsurgency has worked continues. And the idea that American counterinsurgency has worked keeps going because of a certain story that has come into being since the end of the Vietnam War and supercharged by this past decade of American wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the story goes like this, that counterinsurgency wars can be won as long as the hidebound conventional armies that fight these wars are transformed to the proper methods of doing counterinsurgency correctly by savior generals. Now this, this narrative is not just an academic issue. It's an important narrative to understand its roots and how it has come about because it continues to inform how Americans think about war today and in the future. And this narrative is the stock explanation for much of the recent work that has been done on Iraq and Afghanistan. Let me just give you a few ex uh, examples. These writers all accept this basic counterinsurgency narrative of savior generals turning their hidebound armies around and putting the war on the path to success. Max Boot in his recent book, Invisible Armies, fully buys into this narrative. Uh, Tom Ricks in his two books, Fiasco and The Gamble, also uses uh, this narrative. Fred Kaplan 
in his book published last year called The Insurgents, uses the narrative. Linda Robinson, uh, in her book Tell Me How This Ends, uses this stock narrative. Paula Broadwell, in her book All In, her biography of David Petraeus, uses this narrative. And in a recently, just came out a couple of months ago, Pete Mansour, who I think is going to be here in a couple of weeks um, giving a talk on his book, also fundamentally buys into this narrative of a savior general turning a war around, teaching an army how to do counterinsurgency, and putting the war on the path to success. And the title of Pete's book is very telling because it really, it really shows how powerful this narrative is. The title of Pete's book is Surge. And then the subtitle is My Journey with General David Petraeus and the Remaking of the Iraq War. So what Pete has done in his title is first very interesting. I mean, most people would refer to Surge as the Surge, but he's removed the article, right? So it puts the Surge in line with the great military operations or campaigns in history. And the subtitle is also very, very telling. His journey with General David Petraeus as the commanding general and the remaking of the Iraq war. The idea that this general turned the war around. Let me build a little bit more on how this narrative is constructed um, with regard to Iraq. And it goes like this. In Iraq, from 2003 to 2007, the American army fumbled. It didn't get it. It didn't understand how to do counterinsurgency and was fighting the war wrongly. And by the end of 2006, the war was lost or, either, or, or on a path to being lost. But then, as the narrative goes, an enlightened general, a savior general, to use the exact words of the popular historian Victor Davis Hanson, named David Petraeus, rode onto the scene, armed his army with the big ideas of classic counterinsurgency, things like protecting and securing the population. He turned his army around almost on a dime, almost immediately. And because of the savior general's radical new style of generalship and a fundamental change in operations brought about because of this general, the war was turned around in Iraq and put on a path to success. I mean, does this sound familiar? I mean, it's, it, again, I've just listed a number of books who all buy into this basic narrative. It is the essence, right, the guts of most of the stories and the things um, that are written on Iraq. Unfortunately, however, it is mostly moonshine. The primary evidence, I'm going to talk more about This is a great place to talk about primary evidence. I mean, I spent two years ago, I spent three years ago, I spent weeks in the archives right here doing research on the Vietnam War, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in, in a minute. But the primary evidence on Iraq, documents, the stuff of history, right, shows that there was no significant change between General Casey, General Petraeus' predecessor, who came before him, and in terms of the operational method of the pre-surge and surge armies, what the evidence shows is much more continuity than discontinuity. The reason for the lowering of violence in Iraq that started by late summer, fall of 2007, had much more to do with other conditions that were occurring on the ground. The spread of the Anbar Awakening, the Sunni tribes from the western provinces into places like Baghdad, a decision by Shia militia to stop attacking Sunni civilians, the role of Iran. Um, these conditions were really the critical conditions on the ground that brought about a lowering of violence by the end of 2007. Absolutely, the additional surge brigades played a role, but they weren't this, this, this causal mechanism as the surge sort of narrative, counterinsurgency narrative portrays it, that it was Things are going badly, General Petraeus arrives, additional brigades, they're doing something different. That is what brought about, or that is what brought these other conditions along that led to the, uh, to the lowering of violence. Um, and so many people really have come to believe that it was an enlightened general who transformed his army to doing something very, very differently, and that was the primary cause for the lowering of violence. Now, this, this myth of the savior general um, in Iraq is premised on another myth or half-truth from history. 
And that's the Vietnam War. And in that war, you have another story of a savior general turning the war around. And his name was General Creighton Abrams when he took command from General Westmoreland in the summer of 1968. And he did basically the same thing that General Petraeus did 40 years later, according to this narrative. He turned the war around, uh, around on a dime, got the American army doing counterinsurgency correctly, and thus, according to Abrams' biographer, Louis Sorley, made the Vietnam War a better war. More moonshine. Back to primary evidence. If, you, if one consults the primary evidence, the documents, the stuff of history, the contemporaneous documents of the time, one sees a striking level of continuity between Abrams and Westmoreland. The idea that there was a radical difference in generalship between Abrams and Westmoreland and that operationally Abrams forced or turned his army around very quickly is not in any way supported by primary evidence. And again, here um, at AHEC is a great place to talk about primary evidence. And the primary evidence on Vietnam does not support um, that view or that interpretation. Now, to be sure, the idea that Abrams turned the war around in Vietnam, made it a better war, is a compelling one, since it offers up the idea that the Vietnam War was actually won in the South because of the changed ways of Abrams and his army. But truth should never become the victim of a good story, even if that story is a morally compelling one. The myth, the story of Abrams transforming the war is very much similar to the Iraq War narrative, and it goes like this. Again, very similar. Westmoreland from 65 to 68 had only one word. Now, this is how writers like Fred Kaplan in his new book, The Insurgents, Tom Ricks has portrayed Westmoreland this way. Max Boot in his new book, Invisible Armies, and this goes all the way back to writings in the 1980s by people like Andrew Krepenovich. This is how they portray Westmoreland in the Vietnam War. And they use this, this actual, this very ver this, th th these kinds of words. In this view, Westmoreland from 1965 to 1968 had only one word, one word, to, ex to explain his strategy to defeat the insurgency in Vietnam. And that one word was firepower. Again, Ricks has used this, Max Boot has used this, Fred Kaplan has used this formulation to explain Westmoreland's strategy for Vietnam. But then as the story goes, after the Tet Offensive in the summer of 1968, General Abrams came on board, refocused the American army, got it doing counterinsurgency correctly, focused it on pacification and winning the hearts and minds of the rural folk in the South Vietnamese uh, uh, countryside and fought a better war in a more enlightened way. And most importantly, radically different from Westmoreland. But, but again, if this portrayal of Westmoreland and Abrams is true, it should be supported by evidence, but it's not. You know, a, a couple of, it was year, two years ago, I was on a panel with my colleague at, at West Point, Colonel Greg Dattis, and, and Bob Sorley was on the panel, and so was writer Tom Ricks. And Tom Ricks made a really, he made a very sort of telling statement. And he said, because Greg Dattis and I were arguing the same basic thing, I about Iraq um, and Petraeus and Casey and Greg about Westmoreland um, and Abrams, and Tom Rick says, um, you know, I always hear you historians talking about this smoking gun piece of evidence that Westmoreland really viewed the war in a different way other than just firepower. But you see, the truth of the matter is that if you go into like the archives here and you look at what Westmoreland was saying and how he thought about the war, to say that he had one word to explain his strategy and that being firepower is just not right. So again, if this portrayal of Abrams is correct, then again, there should be evidence to support it. But again, the evidence doesn't support it. In fact, it supports the idea that Abrams fought the war very much like Westmoreland did. Bob Shorley, in his book, A Better War, argues that within 15 minutes, Abrams, quote, changed everything. Within 15 minutes, unquote, from the way Westmoreland was... Right. I mean, yeah. 500,000 American soldiers in an area security mission, one man can come in in 15 minutes and change everything. No. So if this is, but if this is true, 
How then does one explain the evidence that are in archives like here about how Abrams fought the war when he took command? Let me give you some examples. In his first commander's conference after taking command in the summer of 1968, Abrams said that the critical problem for the American military in Vietnam was to, quote, inflict significant attrition on the enemy, to grab a hold of him, and to destroy him. This was the payoff argued General Abrams, to kill the enemy. So the point here, by using this evidence, is just as Westmoreland really believed in the use of American firepower to defeat MVA and main force units, so too did Abrams, and in that regard, not much really changed. Now, for sure, by 1969, because the context, especially the political context of the war, had changed, uh, and Vietnamization and Richard Nixon coming into office, Abrams was able to devote more energy and time toward pacification of the rural countryside. But that was really a modest shifting in the overall effort. Um, and it had a lot more to do with the enemy's change in strategy than with any kind of significant operational turnaround. So in the end, as far as military strategy for the U.S. and Vietnam, both Westmoreland and Abrams adhered to what was often called the one war concept, which had to balance the three pillars of main force war, pacification of the countryside, and building up the South Vietnamese military. The explanation for America's loss in the Vietnam War was not monster general generals and stupid armies who didn't know how to eat soup with a knife. Instead, the answer for America's loss in Vietnam was a failure of grand strategy that should have realized, as George Herring, eminent diplomatic and military historian, formulated in the late 70s, early 80s, that, uh, that the war was unwinnable based on a moral and material price that the American people were willing to pay. But you see, this fundamental truth of the Vietnam War is obscured by the better war myth this narrative, this story, that a failed grand strategy in Vietnam could have been rescued if the U.S. Army, Army simply had better generals in command earlier on and fought the war at the tactical level differently. Then Iraq came around almost 40 years later, and the same narrative or story started to unfold. A war being lost by a failing army that didn't understand counterinsurgency but was rescued by a savior general who turned the war around. And that explanation really became hardened into an, an accepted truth, almost like a fact, by 2009. And if you remember, that narrative, that story, that idea of an enlightened, better general replacing a failed one, turning a war around was then transplanted directly to Afghanistan in the spring and summer of 2009. Hence the abrupt relief of General McKiernan and his replacement with General McChrystal. And if you remember at the time, McChrystal's arrival was being explained in this greater narrative. And oftentimes references were made to the failed general in Vietnam, Westmoreland, who was saved by Abrams, and in Iraq, the failed general Casey, who was saved by Petraeus. In spring and summer of 2009, this narrative took hold and was put into place in Afghanistan. And carrying that narrative over to Afghanistan in the spring and summer of 2009 ended any real chance that was there at that point in time for a fundamental relook of American strategy in Afghanistan. And American strategy in Afghanistan needed to be relooked and reevaluated. Um, Augustine and then Little Hart both said that the purpose of war, in a very general, broad set, just thinking, you know, almost philosophically about why wars are fought, both of them said that the purpose of war is to produce a better state of peace. So if a state does that when it fights a war and it spends blood and treasure and it produces a better state of peace, then a state gets a passing grade. But my assessment, my evaluation of American strategy in Afghanistan is that the United States in terms of strategy deserves an F and here's why. Let me give you an explanation for this. 
And when I use the term strategy, I mean, this is a really, there's nothing fancy here, right? I mean, it's a simple ends, ways, mean formulation of strategy. But this is how I think about strategy. And I think generally this is supported in history. Strategy and war sits in the middle of two different things. Over here is the political or policy objective that puts war into place. Strategy sits right here in a plane, in a, in a different place. And then over here on this other side are the resources of, of war, oftentimes the use of military action. What strategy does in war is it looks to policy to see what the political policy aims are and then looks to the resources of war to achieve that policy aim. But here's the kicker, at the least cost in blood and treasure spent. Right? So if, if a state does strategy right in war, that's how it should go about doing it. And in Afghanistan, I think the United States has failed at that. And here's why. The core policy objective for the United States in Afghanistan from the beginning, the core policy objective, what put war into place for the United States in Afghanistan from the beginning, and I'm going to tell you what it is in a minute. And, the, and I base this, again, off evidence, right? And the evidence that I've used to come up with this core policy objective is I went to, for the last, since 2002, all, almost up to the present, I went through and read the transcripts from the Senate and House Armed Services Committee. And when they had generals coming from Afghanistan, like General Barno, like General Franks earlier on, then McNeil, then McKiernan, right, then McChrystal, then Petraeus, Secretaries of Defense, Under Secretaries of Defense, uh, Defense, Secretaries of State. When these people went before Congress and congressmen and senators would ask this question, usually at the beginning of, of, of the testimony, they would say, General Petraeus, General McNeil, Under Secretary Flournoy, Secretary Gates, why are we in Afghanistan? And the answer over and over and over was actually, and this is what I think is the political objective, the answer over and over was the destruction of Al-Qaeda, period. So if you think about it, that's a very, very limited core political objective, right? And an appropriate one too, because Al-Qaeda attacked the United States on 9-11. The reason why I'm saying American strategy has failed in Afghanistan is that it's taken this core limited political objective and used a maximalist operational method of armed nation building, American counterinsurgency, to achieve that very, very limited core political objective. That's why I'm saying American strategy has failed in Afghanistan and the whole counterinsurgency narrative that really hardened into concrete by the spring and summer of 2009 helped to continue this maximalist um, operational method to, to achieve this very limited core policy objective. Now, in, in, in making the argument that American strategy has failed in Afghanistan, it should not take away from the tactical operational successes that the United States has had, not only in Iraq, or not only in Afghanistan, but also in Iraq. I mean, many of us, a lot of us in this room have either been connected to, known people, ourselves have been over there to these places um, and deployed. So saying that American strategy has failed doesn't take away from the dedication, the commitment, the hard work, um, and all that we have done on the ground in these places. But in the end, in war, tactics, tactical success, operational success, that's supposed to lead up to something. It's supposed to produce, if little heart is right, a better state of peace. And again, looking at the cost for the United States wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's hard to see where that better state of peace is at. Um, this, the, the counterinsurgency narrative that I've been talking about has also, it's, it's, it's very interesting. When I, I've made the argument before that counterinsurgency is dead. And first, the usual, a lot of the response is, well, counterinsurgency is not dead. We may have to do it again. And I've already said that that may happen, although it's, it's hard to imagine why. Um, but counterinsurgency has kind of gone off and it's lost a lot of the luster and, 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 um, uh, that, that, it, that it once had. But you can, you can actually see the idea of counterinsurgency and the story and the narrative behind it 
being morphed into different types of things. For example, there's this, there, there's this idea. Um, it's not an idea. It's actually almost a, a, a framework, a method for the United, that, that came out of the United Nations, and it's called Responsibility to Protect, R2P. Right? A number of years ago, when the war in Syria first started flaring up, a number of people in America were making the argument that the United States had a responsibility to protect the Syrian people in the, in the Syrian civil war. Because the whole idea behind responsibility to protect is the idea that you have to use expeditionary military force to achieve the goals in R2P. So the whole notion behind the counterinsurgency narrative that war was made to work because of a better general who turned his army around is oftentimes embedded in the arguments of, 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 of people when they are making the call to use military force to protect civilian populations in different parts um, of the world. The, the other concern with this counterinsurgency narrative. Again, and deeper than that, the idea embedded in the counterinsurgency narrative that the United States, especially in Iraq, made war work. This, this, this idea, I think, is keeping the American army today from having a real honest discussion about what we've achieved at the level of strategy in Iraq and Afghanistan. Because we've still latched on and we bought into, we're trapped by the idea that we made war work in Iraq and maybe in Afghanistan, it's keeping us from, I think, doing a real honest um, and careful evaluation of what, we've, what have our operations actually achieved um, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I also think it's, 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 it's pushing the Army, it's, it's almost like the Army today we won't let go of Iraq and Afghanistan. Because we did operations there and we spilled blood and treasure, well, they had to have worked, right? And so we're keeping a hold of Iraq and Afghanistan in this way, and we're actually projecting it into the future. And I think we actually see some of the results of that with some of the things that the Army is putting forward now, like this idea of regionally aligned forces, brigades associated with different parts of the world, like North Africa, South Africa, right? That whole sort of construction of how to use army brigades, again, is tied to the idea that the United States Army made war work in Iraq and Afghanistan, nation-building war work in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the other concern about the power of this narrative, that war works because savior generals make it so, is that if we continue to believe that war works, that will be the argument, the call to use military force in a place like Syria or other places in the world. You see, because for the better war thesis, the counterinsurgency narrative, and its home base in the myth of a better war in Vietnam, war always works because savior generals who turn their armies around make it so. So you can see with this narrative why it is so appealing and dangerous at the same time, and why maybe it's a recipe for perpetual war. And with that, I'd like to hear your questions. I have to let them. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll uh, take questions now. Please wait for a uh, speaker or for a microphone to come to you, and please limit yourself to one question at a time. All right, we'll get right here, start right here on this side. <clears throat> I've heard uh, Ambassador uh, Crocker make an assessment that's remarkably similar to the proposition you just laid out. Uh, are you aware? of a similar thesis to yours in the diplomatic community? Mm. Well, I know Senator McCain um, just made the recommendation that in order to um, uh, save Iraq from the fires of civil war that it faces now, um, the United States should send back to Iraq General Petraeus um, and, Ad and Admiral Crocker. I, um, uh, or uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Ambassador Crocker. You know, I'm not privy 
um, um, to um, how the State Department thinks. Although I just know in sort of the history of the State Department with regard to Iraq, some of the arguments, um, some of the assessments and the evaluations that they were doing early on, even before uh, the war started, th that kind of, um, of thinking would, wouldn't surprise me um, with, within the State Department. Can we, this, I think, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I understand we're involved in Somalia again. Do you think Somalia is our next counterinsurgency effort? I hope, I hope. I, I mean, if, 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 you say, if, you say, if you say our next counterinsurgency effort, and if you say counterinsurgency, meaning um, American-style counterinsurgency, um, which again is armed nation building to defeat an insurgency, th then I think um, we would, I hope we're not, we're not doing that. I mean, you know, what we're doing is counterterror, those, those kinds of, of operations there. I mean, one of, you mentioned Somalia, one of the things, um, in, in, the, 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 you know, the whole counterinsurgency movement that really came to the fore in 2006 with the writing of Field Manual 3-24, right, and then with the surge of troops and, and, and the, all of the things that were written about it, um, and in the literature of counterinsurgency, one of the laments that is usually thrown out there is that, boy, you know, why didn't the American army pay more attention to counterinsurgency um, in 2002 as it was getting ready to, you know, um, uh, uh, in, uh, invade Iraq? And the implication in, in, in those kinds of statements is, is usually it's an embedded counterfactual. It's the idea that if the American army had paid more attention to counterinsurgency in 2002 before we went into Iraq, then things would have turned out much, much better which I find actually quite silly. Um, and it's also, you can also, because then it goes into, well, see, you know, look what happened. We went into Somalia. We didn't understand the people, the culture, the place, all those other kinds of things. The implication is that if we would have been armed with counterinsurgency doctrine and knowing how to do counterinsurgency, then somehow it would have turned out better. But then I'm thinking, what would... It would have been a good thing for us to stay in Somalia for eight or nine or ten years doing nation building. I mean, I think, you know, th there's the other thing I didn't mention in my talk, but what really comes, I think one of the lessons that we really need to learn from these last ten years of war is what Andrew Basevich has argued over and over and over again, and that is the limits of military power and when military force can have utility. And if we think that we can use military force to transform an entire society, which is what John, the exact words that John Nago used in a written article four or five years ago to explain uh, the American army and what it would be doing into the future. I think we're, um, it's, it, it can work. We can transform an entire society at the barrel of a gun, but it will take generations and generations. And then one has to go back and ask oneself, why are we there in the first place? And is that kind of effort worth it? And it's hard to imagine anywhere in the world, Somalia or anywhere else, where that kind of effort um, uh, would, be, would be worth the cost, based on what the political goal or objective is. I think you just got into part of the answer that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. But in your book or in your studies, have you addressed where the culture that we are imposing ourselves upon is not capable or willing to participate to accept their role in the CI equation in achieving the objective. Um, absolutely. I mean, that goes in a lot of different directions. It gets into the political culture of the country, um, the, the, the society, um, the, the people themselves. Um, and the whole, the whole problem of a foreign occupying power on the ground in a place like Iraq or Afghanistan, Afghanistan, trying to put forward these kinds of transformational societal, political, cultural changes. Um, it, it, like, like I said in the, in the last answer, it, it, it can work at the barrel of a gun, but it's, it's, it's going to take generations. And it's not going to be done, and it's not going to be achieved by simply firing a general who supposedly doesn't get it, 
and changing the tactics of the army on the ground that's fighting these kinds of wars. I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you look at, the, in, in the long view, the history of small wars, and, and a good friend of mine, Doug Porch, has just come out with a new, a new book on counterinsurgency, and he makes his argument really, really well. In these kinds of wars, in these small wars, call them counterinsurgency or whatever else, the tactics of the armies that fight these wars just aren't that important. What really decides matters in these wars are the, the, the decisions of strategy and policy. I mean, that's what explains Iraq. I mean, if we're trying to understand why Iraq is in civil war right now, why it turned out the way it did, the answer isn't because the army didn't understand counterinsurgency until it was rescued by, in 2007 by General Petraeus. It's because of the key strategic and policy decisions that were made early on that set Iraq on a course um, to civil war. So again, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna do this kind of operation, it's not gonna be done in six or seven or eight or nine years. It's gonna take 50, 60, or 70 years if you really wanna transform a society at the barrel of a gun. More question. Uh, is some of our problem we're going into countries where there are large groups of people that just hate each other? I mean, and so what are you gonna do? Yeah. Okay, so my, um, it, uh, whew. when I, a, a little, a, a, a sto my own personal story, um, uh, I, I commanded a, uh, an armored reconnaissance squadron in West Baghdad in 2006. Um, we started off in, in West Rashid, which is the lower uh, southwest quadrant of Baghdad, and the second half we moved up into the northwest portion of Baghdad, and we concentrated in the Sunni district called Amria. Um, it, Two or three weeks after the late February uh, Samara Shrine bombing, I figured, I, I mean, it, 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 I figured out that this place, I'm in, I'm in the middle of a civil war, right? Um, with, and, and I wasn't a neutral player in that civil war. I mean, I did things that satisfied one side, that upset the other side, various sides were attacking me, I was fighting it, they were fighting each other. We were caught in the middle of this thing, right? So, and that's what I experienced in West Baghdad in 2006. And so then when I, when I got back in early 2007 and the counterinsurgency manual first came out, and I still remember the, the, one of the, fir the first time sitting down and reading it. And I came to the part, I think it's in, in uh, maybe it's in, it's, in the, it's in the first chapter where they have, it has the depiction of the population. If any of you are familiar with the Army's Field Manor 3-24, it has a graphic depiction of a population in a foreign country where an insurgency is occurring. And it says this. It says, in any situation, whatever the cause, there will be a population that looks like the graphic displayed. And the way the graphic portrayed it was, it was like the top of a shoebox. And the top 10% represented a portion of the population that were just hardcore insurgents, and you had to kill them or capture them. The bottom 10% represented a part of the population that was on your side and the government side. The rest in the middle was a malleable mass waiting to be won over either by you or the insurgent force. Now that depiction may represent a given population that's, that's dealing with an insurgency. But when I read that after spending a year in West Baghdad, I mean, this, I said, I, this is just, I said, I'll, re, I'll draw this diagram and I'll use this shoebox and I'll draw a line right down the middle because they had already decided and committed to one side um, or, or the other. So I guess the, 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 the point that I'm making is that in order to try to, I mean, that's why this whole notion of using military force in Syria, either from the air, putting troops on the ground, I mean, that's essentially what you're doing. You're putting military forces in the middle of a place that's experiencing a civil war. And yeah, you can, I mean, a, a, a military force can separate the sides, can stop it, but it's gonna be costly. And in the process of doing that, you produce death and destruction in trying to stop it. I, I, had a, I want to get a question from this gentleman right there. Is that okay? Thank you. Argument against armed state building. Yeah. You remind us it takes a lot of time, right. generational, to affect political and social change. 
you warn us about the danger of perpetual war, and the drain that could have on our resources. But we're still in Afghanistan. Do you think we have a way forward now in Afghanistan, perhaps yeah. downsizing our expectations? Or have we, have we uh, just uh, screwed it up too royally? Um, uh, there's actually there's um, I, I appreciate that question. Um, there there is a, a, a body of literature that uh, actually argues that um, it would have been better for the United States once it went in and, and now you can make a separate argument of how effective the American operations were initially to go in after Al Qaeda. Um, but after that, there is a body of literature that argues that actually it would have been better for the United States not to commit to this extended period um, of, of, of armed nation building. I, no, the prospects in Afghanistan are, 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 at least for the United States, are not good. Um, I mean, it, it's... I mean, there's the whole domestic political context with uh, our, our problem with our own finances, our own economy, um, whether uh, or not our Congress will continue to uh, provide six to ten billion dollars a year to Afghanistan, um, especially when the president of Afghanistan continues to say bad, nasty things about the United States. Um, so it's. I, I think the prospects are um, uh, not only for the Afghans, but for the United States as well. Or, or not. I mean, it's not. We, we can. I mean, one of the, one of the possible scenarios is um, we 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 cut a deal. Maybe we keep a few thousand troops there. Maybe we don't. Uh, we continue providing resources to the Afghans, six ten billion dollars a year, and in three or four years, Congress just says, just like Congress did, you know, in 1972 with the Vietnam War. That's it. We're done. Right. So the, 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 maybe the better alternative is to realize that this thing is just going to fizzle. And so maybe we should accept um, some tough things right now. And that is that we really do have to sit down and negotiate with the Taliban to try to come up with some kind of political solution now while we're still there, rather than continuing to trying to continue to push this down the road, especially since potentially it may very well fizzle. Um, and they'll be left without any resources or anything. Yeah, I was wondering if you might um, be able to talk a little bit about the, the origins and the propagation of the narrative, yeah. uh, particularly in light of two yeah. parallels yeah. between Vietnam and Iraq, yeah. which is a new president looking for a face-saving excuse to get out. Yeah, you mean, so the origins of, because they can go a lot of different directions with that question. Where did the story start? Yeah. It started, let's, who, at the beginning. It started, um, Vietnam is, Vietnam is absolutely, for American counterinsurgency, Vietnam is, is, it is really important. The, the Vietnam War, because you start to see the origins of the counterinsurgency narrative developing during the Vietnam War itself. I mean, people looking for a better way. The argument between CIA folk, special forces, the, 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 the military people who were a part of cords, right, and pacification, making the argument that the Army's fighting the war the wrong way. Too much firepower, not, a much, not enough focus on pacification. So the origins of the counterinsurgency narrative really start in the, in the fighting of the war itself. But it really takes hold, at least for the United States, after the Vietnam War, and especially in the early 1980s. Um, and there were a couple of fundamentally important books for the counterinsurgency narrative. The first one was written by Harry Summers, who was right here at the Army War College when he wrote it on strategy. And his argument wasn't, it doesn't become part of the counterinsurgency narrative, but it's the opposite side of the coin, so to speak, because Summers says the Vietnam War was winnable if only the American Army had fought it better, differently by using different tactics, a different operational framework, going into Laos, seeing off the board, that thing. And then roughly around the same time, other people started to make sort of, it's, it's this, it was the same argument, but it was the opposite side of the coin. And that was people like Andrew Kropenovich with his 1986 book, The Army in Vietnam, who argued like Summers, although differently, said no, the war in Vietnam could have been won if the American army hadn't been so stupid. 
and hadn't been fixated on artillery and trying to find Omaha Beach uh, in the Central Highlands. And the answer was staring them supposedly in the face. And the answer for winning in Vietnam, and again, this gets to the origins of the narrative, was what the British did in Malaya from 1948 to 1956. Because what the British did in Malaya gets morphed into this explanation for how the United States could have won the war in Vietnam. So those, are, that's, those two cases are really the origins for the counterinsurgency narrative. And then within American military and defense circles, you have a small cluster of folks in the 1980s who wrote about this. But in the 1980s, the American army was focused on Europe and airland battle. And in the 90s, they continued to write about this. And then the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan hit. And so then you have that narrative already in place. And now it seems to be just offering the solution um, for the problems in Iraq. I, th I thought your analysis of, of critique of Corning is entirely persuasive, both in terms of the dubious lessons that were drawn from Iraq yeah. and also the hubris Right. Thinking you can lift and shift FM 324 right. and drop in Afghanistan. You also hinted in your, in your talk, I think, that the real problem may be regarding strategy. Yeah. Coin is essentially an operational, even Absolutely. operational tactical right. framework. Right. There's probably been two big frameworks in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. One, the transformation agenda, which drew out of RMA and yeah. Desert Storm, yeah. and the other, Coin. Mm -hmm. Both, yeah. in a sense, have been operational solutions to I, I, strategic absolutely. problems. Yes. W would you like to expand on, on are, yeah, we talk, it, are we seeing a failure strategy? You said it per I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Um, it is, and, and here we can get to the culture of uh, the American Army, um, and I'm really interested um, in uh, looking to read Tony Echeverria's new book that's coming out soon on um, a, a revised look at um, what he calls what the, new, the, the American way of war. Um, and my, my, my sense is that this whole, this whole operational fixation is, um, this, this is a part of American army culture. And, it, and this also, I think, really emerges, um, um, although again, I, I'm really interested to read Tony's book, um, this, th this either emerges or it's reinforced, certainly after the Vietnam War. Because the American army after the Vietnam War says we just don't want anything to do with policy at all. I mean, it becomes very Jomanian, right? We're going to, you know, Paul, you know, it's the classic scene from Top Gun, right? Where the Tom Skerritt is standing there, you know, policy is made by civilians. We're, you know, the pointy end of the spear or whatever. I mean, that really kind of in encapsulated it. And the American army came out of Vietnam with the idea that we only do operations. We're gonna focus on operations um, and we're just gonna leave policy aside. And I actually think that that whole sort of mindset contributed to the broken strategies that brought us into Afghanistan and Iraq. Because actually, if you're gonna do good strategy, operations and policy have to interact and come together, right? But with the American Army, we become so fixated on an operational solution because the current, le I mean, that was the army I came up in, that Matt and I came up in, in the 1980s and the 1990s. An army that was operationally focused. And it was airland battle. And then when Iraq comes into place, the, the American army maintains that focus on operations, which, I mean, it's under, an army needs to do that. But at some point, somewhere in the army, it needs to be able to stand back and look at those operations objectively. I mean, I also think that that's the part of the American failure in, in Vietnam, is by 67 or 68, that operational framework should have showed us that it wasn't going to work. But armies, when they fight wars, become so tied, understandably so, because they spill blood and treasure. They become tied to the operational framework that they've been fighting the war, and it's very hard for them to stand back and to be critical of it. I have to let, they have to. Yeah. Uh, question oh, is, could you yeah. address the uh, involvement of the French in the Central African Republic, the potential for the EU support of those operations, and then compare that to how we do business? I'm sorry, the, the French, sir, in the? Central African Republic. 
they're in there now. You, you, oh, and the question is what, how? Yeah, and the potential for EU support of those operations. Yeah. And compare that to how we do business. Oh, well, I mean, I think just from what I've read in the newspapers, what, what I mean, what the French have done in Mali is very different um, from what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, just from, I mean, that's, uh, that's not my area of expertise. I just, you know, know what I read in the newspapers. Um, but I think it seems like the French have learned a thing or two from what we try to do in Iraq um, and Afghanistan. And they've gone into Mali with the idea of suppressing, um, disrupting, um, and then pulling out and then turning it over to local forces or whatever else. And you know what? That may be the, the model or the answer for the United States in these parts of the world where we have interests, but they're not vital. They're important interests, but do they demand the kind of commitment militarily that we put forward um, in Iraq and Afghanistan? Okay. Is a great segue into the question I was bringing up, Shoot. which is Max Man Waring, who's written about the complexities of asymmetric asymmetric warfare. But he's talked about successes we've had yeah. with the with the ah. handful of advisors we had in, in El Salvador in the sure. 80s. Sure. So while you say yeah. uh, counterinsurgency is dead when we're looking at the big things, yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. And what applications do you see for the smaller things, which yes, you absolutely, just brought up, and and how might we go about doing it? Yeah. Um, no, I think that's, uh, although El Salvador is a, um, is, is a sort of a tricky case study um, in that in terms of, of policy, the United States was actually trying to make counterinsurgency, American style, nation building counterinsurgency work because it was trying to do what it thought might have worked in, in Vietnam. Right, and that's where you get into the support of the El Salvadoran government, the training of the Salvadoran military, um, and then you have the limited number of, of Army SF advisors who are on the ground that train the El Salvadoran military. But in the end, I mean, just based on what the secondary sources I've read on El Salvador really brought about an end to the conflict and the war there was the greater political geostrategic change with the fall with the end of the Soviet Union. Um, and that both sides realized that they had to come to some kind of agreement. Again, the point here is in these small wars, we, we have to get off this addiction that the answers to these small wars, these wars of insurgency or whatever else, rest with tactical excellence, right? And El Salvador is another case where what really turned, what El Salvador really turned on were these questions of geostrategy, the end of the Cold War, support of the Soviet Union that was gone. Um, those kind of things. And to be sure, one can find examples in American history of the United States doing counterinsurgency or small wars successfully. I mean, removal of the Indians from the West, uh, the United States and the Philippines that Brian Lynn has written on, um, American involvement in Colombia over the last three to four years with assistance um, uh, and what the Colombian government has done. Yeah, I mean, sure, there's, but what I'm arguing though is the idea of American counterinsurgency, which again, American counterinsurgency, as explained, codified in our doctrine, Field Manual 3-24, is armed nation building. I mean, there's, there's, sometimes people don't like the, oh, it's, it's not that. No, it is. It absolutely is. And if, and if you look at our doctrine the way it's written now, there really is no alternative for the army writ large to counterinsurgency other than that. I mean, if you look at 324, there's one paragraph in chapter five that offers up alternatives to that kind of counterinsurgency. So, I mean, I, I, there's, there, there's all kinds of ways for the United States to get after its interests in the world, sometimes using military force, other times, perhaps not. Hey, Jamie John. Royce. A little red thinking for you. A little uh, what? A little, a little red yeah. thinking for you, yeah. Well, just to, I want to build on what something you talked about just now, and you talked about what we came out of, how the Army emerged from Vietnam into a strategy of, of, that brought us the Big Five and yeah, yeah, Airland yeah. Battle yeah. and all volunteer force. So there were some big changes that resulted from that. Sure. And then you addressed, at the end of your talk, you yeah. addressed the big change that you saw that's yeah. come from Iraq and Afghanistan and this, what you're describing as a failed strategy. Mm-hmm. There's a few things that I would, I would ask you to opine on. 
The first is, do you see this expansion of foreign internal defense function uh, to the conventional force uh, as being as opening up a larger set of options for strategy to choose from mm. when it, when something when intervention is called for, mm. military intervention? Yeah. And do you see the, uh, the the way our doctrine is now migrated or evolved into a, and someone would say revolutionized, into a full spectrum operation doctrine that uh. is preparing for an uncertain future rather than for a select operation that we, we think we want or we think we're going to have. Yeah. And some of those that then in require adaptive and agile leadership. Yes. And perhaps you've talked a little bit about some of the senior leaders, but I think we want some of those characteristics right. all the way through the force. Yeah. Um, and so even the thing you mentioned about the regionally aligned force, it's really there to support some of the national security objectives of partner capacity. So, I mean, we've, we've, we're adapting the force right now to a strategy we don't have the two major theater operations right, strategy Jamie, anymore, right. which brought us that the big right. five and gave us a big hammer to try to use in, in counterinsurgency. Right. right. Do you see some of those as a positive in, in balance with the, the things you've pointed out? No. Okay. I'll tell you, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, uh, I mean, the Army has a, um, a, a, uh, a force that is good at doing foreign internal defense, and it's the Army Special Forces. Green Berets. I mean, th they're good at that. That's what they train to do. I mean, there's the whole piece of, you know, the, the, over the last eight, nine years in Iraq and Afghanistan, SF has shifted a bit, to, uh, maybe too much toward direct action or whatever. But that is what um, Army Special Forces, uh, um, uh, that, that, that's what they do. I, I think, uh, here, let me try to answer, make a comment on what you said, Jamie. I, I think that, um, I use the regionally aligned forces as just um, an, an example to, to try to show how I don't think the American Army is really trying to seriously evaluate at the strategic level what our operations have achieved, and I use the regionally aligned forces um, to do that. It's the, the Army in the next, you know, five to ten years, we're going to, I mean, we've already, you know, the, the story a couple of days ago was we're going to have to go down to 420,000. We're going to have to make choices, and we're going to have to take risk in certain areas. Um, and I, I tell you, Jamie, I, um, full spectrum dominance is an absurd statement for the American Army. We cannot dominate full spectrum operate. We need to be able when we go somewhere to do a specific operation, have full spectrum dominance in a given area of operations. But the idea of being a global land power and full spectrum domination, uh, dominance, I think is just, it, it causes us to not be able to focus on the important things that the American Army has to be able to do. And the important things that the American Army has to do um, in the future is to fight using uh, all arms as a part of a joint force and to bring to the joint force the unique capabilities that only the American Army conventional force can bring. And if that means we have brigades um, that don't spend any time reading about Kenyan culture, I, 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 that's okay, right? Because there are real world um, uh, uh, trade-offs. If we're gonna have, for example, a regionally aligned brigade, then that brigade commander has to make choices in terms of training, what he does with his organization, how he prepares for a deployment, um, or everything else. And, and the other thing with this, Jamie, is I just don't, if, I mean, if you look at what our, what our vital interests are in the world, what our regional interests are, certainly we have plenty of them in Africa. But not enough, I think, to justify a significant restructuring or at least pulling important resources from the American Army and other things um, that it should be doing. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. If I can have uh, Colonel Dawson step up here real quick. So two things. Nobody came here to hear me, but quickly, one, uh, John and what he just did represents exactly what the United States Army War College's mission is, and that's developing strategic leaders, strategic advisors, people who can work at that level. And he pointed out some great examples of how we can uh, think about those problems and apply that uh, to the Army of the future. Number two, agree or not with John Gentile, everyone in here should recognize 
the moral courage it takes for him to make this stand that equates to the physical courage that he exhibited on deployment. And so I'd just like to say thanks for that. Thanks.